Okay, hi everyone. I think we're about ready to get started. Uh, so if you, if you want to just go to the next slide. Great. Uh, welcome everyone. My name is Natalia Nakazawa. This is a uh, special program of the Elizabeth Foundation for the Arts Studio Program. Um, I'm the assistant director of the studio program. And I am just so excited to present this uh, workshop to everybody today. Um, we have two fabulous panelists um, and uh, the name of the event is called, Is There Poetry on Mars? NFTs for Artists with Artix Code founder, Sophia Garcia and post-human poet, Sasha Stiles. So we're very excited. Uh, just a couple of little business things. Um, Please mute yourself. Uh, this is just a regular Zoom call. So, uh, you know, if you're not muted and something's happening, we will hear you. Uh, so please mute your microphones. Um, there will be a short Q&A afterwards. Uh, so uh, it shortly in the chat, I'll put a little welcome message and invite you all to introduce yourselves in the chat, um, as well as, you know, during the presentation, if there are questions that come up for you, um, feel free to pop those in the chat as well. Um, you know, please be respectful. Obviously, EFA is an inc inclusive and affirming environment. We are anti-oppression in all forms and no hate will be tolerated. Uh, if that happens, uh, you will be removed. And we would like to honor, acknowledge and affirm the Lenny Lenape indigenous community and ancestors for allowing us to hold space together in the greater New York City area, um, albeit that we are all kind of in dispersed places, we still um, acknowledge that. So uh, I just want to say thank you um, for coming. For and and if you could go to the next slide. Oh no, we're going to. I messed it up already. Um, okay, so I just want to briefly introduce our two panelists, uh, which are so fantastic. I'm so excited. We have got such amazing femme power here today, um, Sophia Garcia. And Sophia is the co-founder of Artex Code, a digital art gallery specializing in algorithm, algorithmic artwork. And she also works as a technical design strategist uh, in the financial industry, designing and developing accessible web applications at scale. So um, I will let Sophia, uh, oh, actually, you know what? I'm introducing both of them. And then uh, our other wonderful panelist, who's just incredible, um, is Sasha Stiles, who is a poet and artist working at the intersection of text and technology. Her creative practice seeks to decipher the hidden languages of the dawning Novacine, uh, probing what it means to be human in a nearly post-human era. So just in a moment, the two of them will be um, introducing themselves so we can get a little bit more information. So Sophia, go ahead and take it away. Okay, we'll do, let's see. Okay, so hi guys. I am Sophia Garcia. I am the co-founder of Artix Code. She kind of gave you guys the overview, but really uh, Artix Code's whole mission is supporting the generative art space, specifically uh, algorithmic, which means if someone is writing code and making making art with code, uh, I'm interested in kind of su in supporting that in any way that I can. Um, I also work as a strategist, designer, and developer in the financial space, specifically now uh, working with blockchain solutions. So it's been really exciting to kind of see these two worlds come together in, in such different ways. Um, you know, I you guys can read the, the bio more if you want to know more information, but I just wanted to give you uh, a little bit of background into Artex code. So this is one of what, what started honestly as a an Instagram account for me. Uh, I had studied uh, art, art history previously and um, really quickly realized working in a gallery space that it wasn't going to be sustainable a sustainable lifestyle for, for me as an individual. So I decided to uh, pick up coding uh, and kind of take some classes and really, you know, figure out what, what is this, this thing that's powering all this stuff that we're doing? What's this coding thing that people are talking about? And uh, what it did for me was really show the human side of technology. Uh, for the longest time, it was this like omniscient, 
uh, all knowing creature. You would look at cool exhibitions and you would see all of these things moving and you're like, oh, technology. But once I learned the background of it, I actually got to see code as a as its own form of poetry that was, um, you know, able to, to create something beautiful. And so I started um, really looking into creating artwork on my own. And then I created this Instagram account, Ardex Code, and I just started sharing people's work. And it really became this, this large community of people who were just interested in seeing what other artists were creating. And it wasn't until uh, the end of 2018 that I found out there was an event called the, uh, the uh, Contemporary and Digital Art Fair. And I was like, I have to show some work here. So ended up show, showcasing uh, some works from my collection and uh, a uh, commissioned them to do some others. And we ended up selling out the show and we, we sold our first NFT that day. And you know it, that was in 2019 and early 2019. And, and it's, it's no looking back since, ever since that. It's like, okay, I guess we, we do exhibitions. And so uh, at the end of the year, we did uh, this one that you see on the screen in Miami during Art Basel, which was a dream come true. And, and you know, every single artwork here was created with code in some way. Uh, we have GAN sculptures, we have, um, you know, JavaScript and uh, you know, GAN being a generative adversarial network, uh, a lot of JavaScript work here, Python, Blender, and, and, you know, they look like fine art pieces. And that to me is, is the funnest thing in the world. Uh, but since then, uh, you know, we've done a few other few other exhibitions, some of them being predominantly online. So these are some posters of, of the shows that we've done. And, you know, we've done full NFT shows. Uh, I think in 2020 was the, really the first time that we decided to go full force with it. Um, you know, we had a show, it was going to be in Paris, it obviously got canceled. So we decided to do uh, the online fair with the prince and uh, it was a complete bust for us. We didn't sell anything, which was not like us. We did not like that. Uh, we didn't sell. We didn't sell. We felt terrible. We're like, okay, we need to come up with a solution here. Uh, so we decided to list the artist's work on one of the marketplaces, Super Rare, as uh, NFTs. And you know, the the buyers that came in were placing bids, and and you know, we 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 sold the work for more than we had the, the prints listed as. And to me, that was a really big aha moment. And, you know, ever since then, we've been really go, you know, going all in and I've been trying to get more and more artists to take a look into the space and, and help them navigate it as best as I can. So um, that's kind of like my quick, <laughs> somewhat quick overview into, you know, where, who I am and where I stand in this space. I also sit on the curatorial board for Art Blocks, which is another um, uh, another marketplace that you guys can check out mostly on, uh, so it's very on the techie side, but doing really great things. Uh, but I'll, I'll pass it over to, to Sasha now because she's incredible, I can't wait. Oh my gosh, you guys are both so kind and I'm so excited to be here and so honored to be chatting with um, all of you. And Sophia, it's so nice to be able to do this sort of screen to screen. We've been um, chatting on Twitter and Instagram and all that for so long. So it's it's always really lovely to be able to actually um, connect. Um, I mean, again, this is not in the flesh, but this is pretty good for these days. Um, anyway, your work is so inspiring, really excited to be chatting with, with you. Um, I'm gonna actually share my screen because I wanna share some um, visuals as well. So hopefully you guys can all see that. Okay, so I won't read through my intro either. You guys can definitely um, skim it if you uh, feel so inspired. You can also um, find out more about my work at uh, my website, which is sashastyles.com. Um, pretty, pretty easy to navigate to. Um, I guess I wanted to just, um, you know, talk a little bit about my approach, um, just give you some visual examples of my work just to kind of give a context for the conversation, because obviously we're going to be talking a bit about where uh, my work intersects with NFTs. So I just wanted to set that up a little bit. Um, I'm really, you know, excited to share some of my, uh, my, my nascent NFT experiences um, as a text-based artist and particularly as a poet. Um, I know a lot of you are artists, but I do want to talk about um, poetry and how text kind of fits in here. Um, a lot of what's happening right now in the NFT world is, you know, centered on art and a lot of the hype is really around art and quite honestly, um, and we can sort of debate this later, but you know, a certain type of art and maybe even a certain type of artist. 
Um, and I don't think there's been as much attention paid to, um, you know, to what's happening um, in terms of uh, crypto literature, what the possibilities might be for writers, poets, and other sorts of creatives um, in this space. So I really appreciate EFA Studios, you know, centering NFT poetry is in this way. I think that's really cool and forward thinking and um, I'm really excited to get a chance to to chat about it more here. Um, as someone who works at the intersection of text and technology, as Natalia said, I often find myself um, working in kind of a speculative mode um, and NFTs really resonate a lot with me thematically and conceptually. Um, so I wanted to just, again, start with a quick overview of some of the things that I've been working on um, lately. So, um, a lot of my work is rooted in this question. Obviously, I'm a, I'm a poet, so a lot of what I do is text-based, although I promise I won't bore you with too much copy on screen. Um, but I did want to start with this question, what does it mean to be human in the nearly post-human era? Um, this is really core to a lot of what I think about, um, and it was well before I started getting involved in anything related to the NFT space or even digital art or digital poetry. Um, I think a lot about questions like, how are the cornerstones of our universal condition? Things like, you know, being born, falling in love, uh, you know, your faith, how you identify, death, how are those things which are cornerstones of what it means to be human, how are they evolving in the context of technological advances? Um, something I've been thinking about a lot over the past year, especially is how does it feel to be made of flesh and blood in a world that's mostly dominated by plastic and silicon and virtual presence and spectral signals? Um, and I think about these things a lot when I write traditional poetry, but as a speculative poet who has one foot in analog and the other in digital, I often wonder what kinds of poetry will be invented by our cyber selves, engaging our new cyber senses and expressing you know, new cyber emotions and things like that. So to me, NFTs are a really tantalizing tool or a platform to probe those kinds of questions further. Um, so I want also to just share a little bit of um, some projects that have kind of galvanized my interest in this space. So in 2018, 2019, um, my love of poetry and technology led me to become poetry mentor to this um, AI, this humanoid AI that you can see here on screen. Her name is Bina48, um, B-I-N-A, which stands for Breakthrough Intelligence by a Neural Architecture, 48 X blocks per second. Um, and I've been teaching her for the past few years about why I love poetry and literature and art and thinking a lot about why um, AI or machines um, might want to know anything about these things, um, which is you know, sort of a crazy speculative question, but one that I think is really um, been generative for me. Um, the experience of working together with Bina and her developers has got me thinking quite a lot about modes of communication between human and machine. Um, and also about the, pol the possibilities for creative collaboration between humans and machine, which I think is really, um, you know, when you get down to it, that's at the core of what NFTs are sort of hinting at or enabling. Um, so again, just wanted to kind of throw this up on screen just to give you a quick visual of that. So um, on that note of uh, sort of transhuman communication and collaboration, um, I wanted to share this example of uh, cursive binary, which is a language that I've been writing in a lot lately. It's a fusion of my handwriting with binary code. Um, and uh, I use it to you know, translate my own poetry as well as um, poetry of my peers and ancient writers. And, uh, and more recently I've been using it to actually translate some generative text that I've been creating with, um, with AI programs. Um, and uh, you know, initially I was doing this just you know, pencil and pen on paper. Um, and lately I've been evolving it a little bit more into the digital space, figuring out how to config configure it as animations. Um, I'm working on creating a digital scroll right now that kind of continuously unfolds on screen and as a reference you know, to scrolling on our phones. Um, so that's something that has really come out of um, my uh, explorations in, in the NFT world. And I don't think I would have gotten to that point had I not been able to play in, in NFT land. Um, 
So uh, just another quick example, this is actually, um, as you can see, this is a physical canvas. This is um, from a series called Ancient Binary, um, where I'm translating from ancient Greek, ancient Latin, other ancient languages um, into binary code and doing it obviously in a very physical way. Um, but I've actually had a chance to mint some of these canvases as NFTs as well, and kind of build them into the conceptual um, collection of my work um, on the site that I'm uh, working a lot with right now called Hicket Nung, which we'll talk a bit about later. Um, it was one of the first pieces actually that I minted and, and sold and um, was really um, exciting to me to see that there are also ways to take and translate physical work and paintings and you know oil on canvas and figure out how to make it work in the digital space as well. Um, and then um, this is uh, an example, another example of binary translation um, coded in black walnuts and leaves. And I did this in my backyard last year, actually. Um, again, you know, this obsession of mine with binary code finds all these weird manifestations. Um, but this is actually the very first piece that I ever minted as an NFT on Higget Nook. And I, I did it because what I was seeing in the space you know, a lot of what we associate with NFTs is very computerized. It's, um, you know, it's very in the machine. And I love that. I think there's so much, you know, beauty in that. And there's a lot of brilliance happening there. But I also wanted to play a little bit with um, the idea of juxtaposing something natural and bringing in natural elements and figuring out how to make that work in a space too, um, which has been a theme of a lot of the work that I'm doing. And I'm figuring out how to continue carrying this forward and merge the, um, you know, the physical natural world with NFTs um, in some other ways as well. Um, I hope I'm not like boring you guys too much at the outset, but uh, just a few more slides to go through quickly. So this is from an exhibition um, from last early last year, right before everything shut down. Um, the exhibition was called Ars Poetica Cybernetica. And this, um, so these were a couple of display cabinets um, that were filled with printed poetry that I created using an AI powered uh, generative text tool. And I wanted to share this because generative art is such a buzzword right now. Um, and there's so much generative art in the NFT space. And again, it looks you know, very different than this. For example, I think when we think of generative art, there's something di very different that comes to mind. But I think there are a lot of ways to explore what generative means. Um, and you know, I, again, I think there's something interesting about the fusion of the digital and the analog. Um, so uh, you know, again, I wanted to kind of throw this up and maybe we can talk a bit more later about digital and analog. But um, the idea here is, you know, I've, this is something where we've, you know, been printing generative text pieces rather than putting them on screen. So again, there's to me an interesting tension there. Did I do something weird on my screen? No, you guys can still see that, I hope. That's fine now. Yeah. Okay. But where did that little red line came from? Maybe that's generative art, actually. <laughs> maybe there's maybe maybe Zoom is feeling inspired. Um okay. And then uh, this is, so this is just a still actually, um, there's actually a video, uh, an animation of this, a little code poem, but this is another line of AI poetry that I created using um, a sort of a GPT, I think this was GPT-2 actually. So the previous generation of um, kind of the, the go-to language, natural language processing neural net. Um, but I have this ongoing um, exercise where I sort of collaborate with a particular neural net that I've been training and um, feeding new information to and kind of giving my poetry to. And we've sort of been going back and forth for some time. And um, every so often it, you know, it, put, it outputs something that really stuns me. And I like to take that and turn it into something that I can, you know, hold and savor and look at again later. And so this is an example of a line that really spoke to me. And I turned it into a little code poem and used various digital tools to kind of manipulate it. Um, and I wanted to show this because I've been doing these kinds of things for years um, and I never really had any good way to show them or share them. I, like I've, I've had a couple galleries show like little versions of this maybe on an iPad screen here and there, but you know, it wasn't really ideal. and the advent of NFTs has allowed me to do a lot more of this and share it with a much broader audience and figure out, you know, really like how I can curate a collection of these rather than have it just kind of sit on my computer in a folder or something like that. So um, yeah, really excited about uh, continuing to explore um, this space. 
And then just two more things super quickly. So I'm showing just a quick still from a VR app experience that the people at One Times Square created last year for the first ever virtual New Year's Eve celebration. And I was invited by um, a curator named Jess Konatzer from Studio As We Are, who's another you know, pioneer in this space. Sophia, I think you probably know her. Um, and she's amazing. And she invited me to actually participate in this exhibition in this virtual realm and write a poem musing on life in the metaverse. Um, and, you know, then um, that poem and other pieces of mine and pieces from digital artists all over the world were um, exhibited inside this virtual world. And people around the world could download this app onto their phone and then go in and explore. And there's actually, there's this time gallery. There was a whole underground exhibition that you could, your avatar could walk into and explore. And it was pretty amazing. Uh, and it was really eye-opening for me. It was, you know, the end of last year before NFT, you know, the, before the craze really took off. And for me, at least, I'd sort of been dabbling, sort of been like skirting around the edges of this, but that was my first immersion into this world and into the crypto art community. And it was really exciting and helped cement for me that there are all these new ways of sharing art and finding art community and viewing uh, and exploring art. So that was really um, exciting for me. Um, and then the last thing, if it loads, I was having some issues with this, maybe not. Oh, there it is. So just this is a, a little experiment that I've been doing lately. So this is something I'm calling regenerative poetry. Um, again, I'm really interested in generative art, um, you know, created by computers, but also I've been um, exploring for years generative or regenerative art moments in nature. So this is a little visual poem that's coded in sunlight and wind. And to me, it looks very much like a lot of the generative art that I've seen on various NFT platforms that are created purely by computer. And I wanted to put this in conversation with some of those pieces. Um, so this is also something that I've minted and sold um, and is part of an ongoing series. So I just wanted to close with that as sort of a funny conceptual moment. So with that, I will no, I love that. Out of this. That's amazing. Like those little slippage moments where you're kind of not sure where to place it. So it's that's incredible. Yeah, yeah I think Sasha, oh, sorry. Um, the one time square event we I was a co curator with Jess and I think that was one of the first times that I was also introduced to to your work and it was so cool that that event was so it was so fun and get definitely like have to thank Jess can answer if you guys amazing. Studio as we are you guys should definitely take a look uh she's she is amazing and really knows how to bring some of the best people together um in this space so yeah I just I just wanted to, to touch That's on that great so I guess she right she had a hand in pulling us together that's so awesome yeah, yeah. yeah. I'd love to put her name in the chat if either one of you uh, yeah. put it in yeah. there I think that'd be great I'll put it in okay Okay, great. And I've, I've spotlit Sophia for everybody. So I hope you can, you can see her wonderful face. Um, <laughs> so I, at, th at this point, we're going to kind of switch modes. Um, those were two amazing presentations to kind of give you all an idea of the depth of the work that both of them are doing. Um, and now we're kind of going to open it up into a little bit of a discussion amongst us. And then again, as if you have questions, please feel free to put it into the chat so we can make sure to address those um, at the very end. So, you know, in general, NFTs, it's been a buzzword. It's been this like thing that kind of blasted onto the scene seemingly out of nowhere, um, you know, just causing everyone, some people to be overjoyed, some people to cringe, some people to, you know, sort of cower in fear. I mean, it's, it's really, it's been one of the most divisive um, you know, thought provoking mediums uh, to hit the art community. And, you know, typically artists um, are quick adapters of, you know, new technologies or like, you know, 3D printing or other kinds of new technologies that have hit the scene. Um, but it is interesting that, you know, this particular medium has become so divisive and so uh, much about um, the imagination and what's possible and, uh, you know, kind of feeds into the fear of post-human existence, I think. I think there's a little bit of the fear of that. Um, so I'd love to hear from you, Sophia, like, what is it about? Like, maybe can you give us a little background and maybe are there any, like, 
you know, buzzwords or like letters essentially that we should understand how to use? Uh, yes, yes, <laughs> yes, yes, and yes. I think uh, one of the key issues at play and why I'm really excited to have this conversation is I think that, you know, we're, we're seeing a lot of people be afraid of something they don't fully understand. Um, I am the first to admit it when I first kind of became introduced to this idea of art and blockchain. It took me a really long time to truly wrap my head around it. And to this day there, I'm learning something new and how to think about it like every day. We are, it is, it is such a new breakthrough way of thinking about how we share art in our current world that, uh, you know, it, it's exciting, but I understand why there's so much misinformation and out of context um, anger uh, being, you know. But how different is it than it. other digital art, you know? I mean, or, or sharing something on Instagram. Like, what yeah. do you think is the real critical difference between, let's say, a website image and like an NFT? Like, what's so? Let's. I guess we can we can start with like breaking down some of like the the terms of like what is a you know a non fungible token like an NFT. Like, what even is that? So if we hear this thing, oh, this blockchain and cryptographic, all of this stuff. I think if you want to narrow it down to like the most basic level, like we just have a very public database, so to speak, very public. You can't change anything that's on it. And, uh, you know, we refer to it as a ledger. Uh, every transaction that happens is, is viewable to everyone. And, uh, you know, we're, we're thinking about it on a very, in the context of NFTs, we're, we're typically thinking about um, this blockchain, not Bitcoin, called Ethereum. There's another one, Tezos, we can talk about a little bit later. Uh, but, you know, for the for what I'm talking about right now, we're, we'll, we'll speak about uh, Ethereum specifically. Mm -hmm. um, Ethereum is a blockchain. It also runs its own, essentially, the world's computer on it. And so you can build applications and all these things on top of its infrastructure, which is amazing. And, you know, we, we're seeing all these really cool things being built on top of it. But we have this idea of a token. Um, you can think of a uh, the actual cryptocurrency itself, uh, you know, one Ethereum, one Ether is one Ether, the same thing as like a dollar, like one dollar is a dollar, you can exchange them and they're worth the same thing. Maybe even like a can of Coke, you can say that too, like one can of Coke, I can exchange it with another friend and like, I know what I'm going to drink. So when we think about something that's non fungible, it cannot be exchanged for another, another item, it is its own unique asset all in itself. Mm -hmm. And so when you think about non-fungible being this unique asset and you think about the word token what a token is it's just a digital representation of an item an asset so mm -hmm. in this instance we're having a digital representation of the artwork be the token and so then when you think about it on a blockchain mm -hmm. the way i like to envision it is kind of like a box like we have this blockchain you have a box now this this record that includes the artwork inside of it, the artist that created it, very important. So now we have this like genesis of this is the artist, this came directly from them. And now anytime someone purchases it, takes a bid on it, that's all public information too. So you can see who bought this artwork for how much, how many times has it switched hands and you can always trace it back to the artist. And because this is a digital asset on a digital blockchain, you can now have these things, we have these things called smart contracts that can now essentially like, are you have programmable art essentially now so it a a, a sorry i'm like getting so excited um, <laughs> so good <laughs> you're like oh my god it's so amazing okay so with a smart contract it runs on its own it once it's out it's out and so this idea being that now every time your artwork switches hands built into that smart contract you're going to get 10 percent of that sale or 5%, whatever it is that you decide in the smart contract. And you can have, you know, a set of rules for in these contracts, you can, you can go as crazy as you want. Um, and, you know, it runs autonomously. And so now you can just sit back, you create your artwork, and every time it passes hands, you'll get, um, you know, you'll get something from that. I think a really good example of this is an artist that I've worked with, uh, you know, from the, the pictures that I showed you guys earlier, you know, I was, we were selling his art back in the day for, you know, 300, 400, $700. And now over this year, he, he released this amazing project that um, has switched hands so many times. 
he's going to make $1.2 million in secondary sales and secondary sales alone. And like, you know, this is a, one example of one artist who did, you know, a very powerful, great project. Um, you know, it's not like that. It, it's kind of, it's the same thing you can't, but this, like, this concept is just, it, it's wild. And so we can think back, uh, how did this all kind of come to be? What is the history of, uh, you know, NFTs and, you, there, there are a few projects that started re really, really early, but um, the modern NFT that we can look at right now, this it's referred to as the ERC721 token. It's a standard of like what it is to be an NFT and like at in today's day and age was really founded by this project. I'm sure you guys have seen them around the CryptoPunks and it's like, what the hell is a CryptoPunk? Like, what is that? Why do I care? What are these 24-bit characters? Like, what, what, what? And so for, you know, all the people who have kind of been into this space, they are the coolest things ever. So they actually, they did it as an experiment. These two guys, uh, they're really awesome guys. Um, and, you know, they wanted to just like test it out. They're like, why don't we, you know, we can try, we can do uh, these characters kind of like, uh, you know, collectibles in a way. And so they just, they created 10,000 of these characters. Not one of them is the same. And they built a smart contract. You can place a bid, you can buy one or you can sell it. Those are the three things that you could do with it. They left them out. They left them for free in the beginning. Anyone could claim them. And so over time, you know, all of them were claimed. And then this whole entire ecosystem started. You could place a bid, you could buy it or you can sell it. And I remember finding one when, you know, back in the day and I placed a bid on it. I was like, oh my God, how exciting. And the way that their uh, their smart contract worked, it was kind of a, it was a bit of a bug where you would place a bid, but if no one accepted it or denied it, it just kind of lived in escrow. So I placed a bid on this crypto punk, no one accepted or denied it. So my money was just kind of like gone. And I was like, all right, I'm done bidding on crypto punks then. <laughs> um, but you know, this was like at the time when they were worth what, like $50. And now it's like, they, they, we just sold nine of them at Chrissy. We, it's like, like the community, we get so excited. Look, um, but you know, th they just sold for, I think it was like an absurd amount of money. I know it took a note here somewhere. Um, I think it was like 16.9 million dollars. It's, it's absurd, but you know, people are really excited about what, um, you know, it brought forward. It, it really brought in this, the, the NFT that we know today, they really helped define that standard. Um, and you know after that i think then you could talk about like the crypto kitties and stuff like that and so it was really fun with the with the collectibles but now we're seeing fine artists really uh use that with their work and i remember the first time i was approached to to tokenize and i'm going to go through these vocabulary words yeah, now absolutely. Um, yeah i have a list here That's um, great. you know to tokenize some of the, a work for an artist and it was on this OpenSea was this, uh, it's one of the, the main marketplaces, it's kind of like the Google of NFTs, if you want to say it that way, they aggregate everything, you can see everything there, you can even mint your own work um, there. And, uh, you know, I was a huge, I was like kind of a snob about it. I was like, I don't want to put my artist's work on there, like next to these collectibles, like, no, there's no chance, there's no chance. And uh, they were like, come on, let's just try it out. And I was like, okay, fine, we'll do it. We did it. Uh, you know, the artist gave his blessing and he's like, all right, we'll, we'll give it a shot. And a buyer came up and he, you want, he told me, he's like, I don't even want the, I don't want the physical piece. I just want the token. And I was like, absolutely not. Like I have it framed in museum glass. Like you have to take, like you're, you're taking it home with you, you know, um, he's like, okay, fine. And, and, you know, after that, I had him show me, he had a whole digital gallery where he had all the, he built a virtual gallery with uh, his artwork, with all of his NFTs that he's collected into it. And that was like a really big aha moment for me. But in all of this, I think, uh, you know, it, it's more and more artists are starting to pick it up. And I, and I, I think in the beginning, we were also looking at them as a uh, certificate of authentication for physical pieces. And we can still, right. and I think we could talk about that um, a little bit that's later. Important, I think that's an important sort of origin history of it is that originally it really was, because people are confused. I think people are confused about the relationship between physical objects and NFTs. Yeah. It's like there, you know, in, in fact, it was originally just like a certificate essentially of authenticity for a physical thing. So the first year that I was working with NFTs, that is exactly how I was thinking about them. So if someone wanted to buy a physical piece, if I, you know, had, had a print from an artist, I would, you know, we kind of played around with the idea, like, 
do you want it? Let's let's token. Let's make a token for you, and that could be your 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 certificate of authentication, essentially. Um, but I think we're starting to see different schools of thought uh, run around this this area. And you know, is it if I get a piece like if I have a print of this piece and it's signed by the artist, is the token that like what is what and i think i don't want to derail too much because i want to get into my vocabulary words but i think that this is a conversation we can kind of take on uh, a little bit later uh you know in during our discussion because it's something that that fascinates me and i've been talking to a lot of friends in like the legal space uh about it so yeah but during all of this i've said the word mint and tokenize and all that stuff and what does it mean um so again we can go back to this idea of NFTs being digital representation of like the asset on the blockchain. And when you when you want to do that, you need to, I guess you can think about it like uploading it to the blockchain or something, but that's what you were referring to is when you say minting it. When you when we mint something or we tokenize it, uh, the words are interchangeable, minting and tokenizing. Uh, you know, you're creating the asset, you're creating the this record of it on to the blockchain so once you do it it is permanent um and the record is so you got to make sure there's no typos you can't go back and edit it uh you know this is this is permanent this is on the blockchain this is your work um and there are a lot of different you know i am the first to say we this process is not perfect it is we are still in such early days but i think we need to look past that like you know dial like it's like not do, using to not using nfts now would be like not using the internet back in the day because of dial up is kind of like the same idea like it's it's basically at the same time right now we're still in dial up era of nfts uh where you hear all the weird noises and stuff like that uh but you know that that is that's where we're at right now and, and the way that uh it all works in, in the back end is really fascinating but at the end of the day it's really not that important. I think in the in the next few years, people won't even be thinking about the words like tokens and stuff. They're just like, oh, I created an artwork on the web. Like this is this is what I did. And you know, they have all these things attached to it that that let it live its own life in our digital ecosystem while still supporting you as the artist who created it. And I think that's the Yeah, I like the idea of it, you know, you release it into this digital ecosystem like a little wild animal that and, and it's it's doing its thing. Like and you don't have to that's the whole relief yeah. it, is that you release the thing and it's doing its own thing. And then if you have one of those contracts, then you're receiving funds from any secondary exchanges. Yeah. So that was part of like, you know, this, the, that ERC 721 token I was talking about, like that is the, that is part of the standard now that makes it so cool that we can actually track its movement across the blockchain. And so, um, you know, that, is but whereas before when I would post something on Instagram or I would do, you know, yeah, let's say post something on Instagram or Twitter, anyone could reshare it and all of these things. And, you know, it's, it's all over the place, but now we have a, now on the internet, you can go over to this artist profile on OpenSea, on super, wherever it may be, see the artworks that they've created and be able to check like, is this the original? Cool, it came from the artists themselves. Who's the person who bought it? Um, and you have, you know, this, this history just there. You're not relying on, you know, all these, like, all this paperwork from this art historian and this person and trying to track the provenance of a piece that, you know, has been around for hundreds and hundreds of years. Now we're at a place where it, it's, it's clear as day and every single computer that's, that's like mined, uh, Ethereum would have to go down in order for you to never see that record again, as long as one computer standing the records stand. So, um, you know, it, it's, it's a fascinating concept and, and it's, and it's exciting. And so I think another word that I think is really um, important is uh, there's a few, but we'll say uh, wallet is one. So like a wallet is your everything in the ecosystem at the moment. So you can, you'll hear about things like Coinbase and, and, um that's probably the probably the only way that it's heard of like like coinbase is like you know this area where you can go and you can buy crypto and you can trade it and all of these things and a lot of people keep their like more as like a a investment type thing where you can just like keep your portfolio there of all of your your cryptocurrencies but a wallet is something a little bit different it lives off of your browser actually it's sort of like a browser extension and it also 
you can have money in there so you can like buy a little bit of ethereum or tezos or whatever it may be and um you know you you use that to one log into the different websites that you're going to the, the different marketplaces that you want to go into and it rent that is your like identity essentially like that is your 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 gateway into all of these um into this ecosystem essentially so everyone has a wallet if i buy something that gets sent to my wallet address and so if i went on uh again like OpenSea being like a good example because it has everything um you know you can put in your wallet address you can find people by their wallet address uh that like that's where you'll see all of your assets so to yeah. speak, all of your artworks. And so I say assets because you can buy a ton of different things. It's not just artwork. You can buy domain names, you can buy collectibles, you can buy like utilities. There's the, the it's endless, the possibilities with, with this stuff, but um, we'll keep it focused again on, on art for now. Um, so in that, uh, the word drop, you will hear it all the time. Like people don't have really like exhibitions anymore like they're having a drop and they're going to drop their work into you know again like dropping it into the ecosystem is probably like the best way to think about it where um you know you'll start hearing people like oh man like this artist like he's gonna have uh his drop is next week and and stuff like that and you know they're, they're just gonna they're gonna just drop a bunch of work and that's really cool <laughs> um i try to not uh say that when it comes to my work the work that i do you know i i do still like to use the words like exhibition it is very much it's a digital exhibition and you can go and you can see the works experience them and purchase them um that way but uh in the in the culture that is currently being formed by all of these crypto dude, so to speak, like, you know, this, you start getting a lot of these types of, of, of words coming out. And that's why I think it's really important to start getting more and more people so we can kind of start crafting our own different narratives and, and really uh, turning it into the space that we want to see for artists. Um, Ethereum and Tezos are two of like the, I, the main the main blockchains that we're seeing in the space right now. Um, they're Ethereum being the primary and then Tezos came in um, and really took over from the artist. Uh, I would say like, it's like more, the Bohemian, it's, it's someone said it's like, it's like vegan eats was how someone praised it the other day, which I thought was hilarious. So one of the issues with Ethereum at it, in its current state is the way that it's kind of like secure and the way that, you know, the blockchains work in the side, it uses this thing called proof of work to, to confirm transactions and at the moment uh proof of work is is pretty much outdated at, the, at right now and and it's really heavy and it, and it consumes a lot of energy it consumes a lot of energy and so you know artists have come out and said we don't support that we can't we can't like you know sit here and let that happen which i completely like understand that it's, it's the artist it's on the artist to kind of like have those like make sure that their their terms are met, you know. Like how, the, speak about the times, reflect on it, and see how we can make change. So we've seen a lot of artists who were originally on Ethereum move over to Tezos, which uses proof of stake. It's very different. Um, it's still a way of, of confirming transactions. And I know this is like a lot of like technical jargon, and it's like, what does this have to do with any of my art? I hope at one point it won't. But right now, where we are in this development stage, it does matter. And uh, you know, proof of stake works very differently. It is a lot more uh, efficient with uh, your your just how the energy is consumed. Uh, you know, it is there are pros and cons to to each of these blockchains. I think Tezos is you know, it, it is a solution for this like proof of stake situation that we're having uh, while we wait for Ethereum to get there. Uh, but, uh, you know, it, it has its own, it's its own cons. Uh, and I, you know, I, I welcome you guys to do like your, your research on, on all of this. Um, and this actually leads me to another vocabulary word, and this one could be my last, but I realized that I didn't touch upon it. Gas. <laughs> Gas is another huge, huge, huge issue um, that, you know, we're seeing is another reason why people are leaving uh, Ethereum at its, in its current state because it's, it's currently, you know, it's on its way to, to getting a little bit better. But gas is this idea where anytime a transaction has to happen, it needs gas to move. It needs gas to, to actually like make it happen, um, to kickstart it. And this happens with a 
what should be a small fee for it. And so uh, this idea of being like, okay, I'm gonna send uh, $20 worth, uh, you know, this artwork that's $20, I'll have uh, my, my gas fee will be a small percentage of that. Well, the issue right now is that Ethereum is like overworked and our gas fees with Ethereum at the moment are out of control. They could be a hundred up to five hundred dollars um, in gas fees, depending on when you're doing it, because the network is is you know really really busy. And we had this idea of like you know in some of our Discord channels and stuff, we're like oh like the gas wars and you know trying to like how how can I buy something when the gas fees aren't absurd, you know? Um, Tezos also helps on this side where their gas fees are nominal. They're 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 nothing. It, it's it's like okay here. It's like also it. just because like of the way that Ethereum again using proof of state versus what was the other one? It's proof of work versus proof, proof of work. Of right. Yeah. Proof and of work, it's just more calculations, right? It's just like more physical computation. Yeah, it's heavy. Required. It's heavy. So yeah. it's heavy. So so I mean, you know, it's. I, th I thought that maybe Ethereum, or there was some article that was basically like, Ethereum is trying to switch over to proof of state it so is. that everything will be proof of state. But right now it's just it's hot. Not, yeah, and there, and we're seeing a lot of uh, this this concept of side chains coming out. So people who are building kind of like, like off of the Ethereum blockchain and building their own, uh, you know, like layer two type thing. So they're, uh, I hope I'm getting these right, and I should know this better. But like, there's Wax, there's Flow, uh, there's another one now, Palm, that's coming out, and they're all, you know, these blockchains that are built, kind of like off of Ethereum, but they're getting rid of the gas fees. They're getting rid of, uh, you know, th this idea of using proof of work. So you know, there, there's innovation happening on, on all sides of things, uh, and, and you know, it, it's. It's a it's the wild west at the moment, I must say, but it's it's so fun to just like dive in it and experiment with it and, and experience it firsthand. I think the the moment you you either mint your own, your first artwork right. someplace places a bid or you even just buy your first one is is such a huge moment and, and it really like makes it kind of like you know sets it all off uh, for you. But yeah, I mean, I hope that was like my my little history like lesson on that and okay, both that's, that's so awesome. And I'm gonna ask, I'm gonna also ask if you have any of those. I put I tried to put some things in the chat, but if there's anything that you that I missed, please put it in the chat because I think it's nice to have that record. Uh, different from uh, cards. It's not. <laughs> it's not. <laughs> uh, with the collectibles, anyway. There's, I think, there's a very big distinction in in there being fine artwork using NFTs and collectibles using NFTs, and uh, you know, they're they're not this. It's like same, same, but different. It's like not. No, um, but let's see if there's anything else. Are you looking at, wait, are, were you looking at Cheryl's question? Yeah, yeah. Is the um, gas charge dependent on the exchange or the token? Token. Um, I would say the, the blockchain, net, like the network that you're, you're on um, and what you're trying to do. So if you're trying to, if you're sending some money from your wallet to another friend or something like that, like that's going to be a pretty small fee. That's not a really heavy thing to do. If I'm transferring artwork that has a ton of history involved with it and, you know, I've, and it has this whole smart contract attached to it, like that's heavier and that it is going to cost a lot more than just, you know, moving funds around or, uh, you know, doing something like that. Like to mint something is, is it is a heavy exercise um, at the moment using proof of work. So um, yeah, hopefully that I want to bring in, I want to bring in Sasha to this conversation and just also ask, and I'm just going to, let's see, bring us back over here. Um, you know, like, how did you sort of encounter all these NFTs? And obviously you were just talking about your, your project with Times Square, which is, uh, incredible. And it, it seems like that's really your first encounter with this world. Yeah, in a way. And by the way, I just want to say to Sophia, that was an amazing crash course. And I wish that I had come to you to just get all that information in one fell swoop when I started, because for me, it was a lot of digging and a lot of trial and error. And like everything you just said was super valuable. Um, so that was great. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, I guess I've been, you know, a lot of my work has sort of been in the technology space and I've you know been researching AI and things like that so I've been really interested in a lot of 
GAN artwork and a lot of generative artwork. And I've been a fan of a lot of artists who've been kind of pioneering in those areas for a while now. So I'd sort of been clocking what they were doing and you know, where, I guess where they were starting to do it. And I was certainly like aware of things like crypto punks and all that, but I think I was definitely clocking it from afar and not quite sure, you know, whether or not I should or could get involved. And I think, um, you know, like so many people last year, just spending so much time online, it started to feel like, okay, you know, maybe, maybe there is something to, you know, this idea of just taking this digital art realm like much more seriously and like really immersing myself in this and getting really, um, you know, really into it in a deep way. And then yes, that Times Square exhibition, I think that was my first um, entry into the crypto art community in a real way, which is incredibly important. I would, I would say like actually to any artist who is wanting to dabble and maybe hasn't done it yet, like the, the single most important thing I think for me in all of this has just been finding the right community, finding community. And, um, you know, that has been really helpful in terms of getting, uh, you know, getting up to speed, finding my feet in these areas, um, no matter whether you're, you know, brand new to it, or if you, you already know a lot, I think finding the right community and just getting to know people in this space is like the single most essential thing to do. And for me, that exhibition um, at the end of last year was that because it it was, you know, a, a place where VR artists and AR artists and people that were doing all sorts of amazing generative artwork were all gathering together in this virtual realm at a time when we couldn't travel and we couldn't be together in person. We were able to meet up in this virtual environment in, you know, in this in the metaverse in, in Times Square. Um, and, you know, talk to each other about our artwork and introduce ourselves to each other and get to know what we were working on. And um, there's so much inspiration in that, like both in terms of what, uh, you know, what platforms, what tools people are using, and in terms of, you know, like what kinds of projects they're working on and what's on their radar. So I think like that really got me excited to get more involved um, in a, you know, in a real way. And then like so many people, um, including many of my artist friends, when we saw what happened with Beeple, Beeple's sale earlier this year, um, that kind of pushed everything over the edge. Um, Can and you just, talk, just sort of catch us up, you know, when you say Beeple. <laughs> I don't, maybe Sophia like would have a better, like, I don't know, summary of this, but Beeple is an artist, a digital artist who's been um, doing really um, interesting, um, you know, digital art, generative art and things like that for a, a long time and whose work was sold at auction um, by one of the major auction houses for I think somewhere in the realm of like 60 or $70 million earlier this year. And it was kind of the first sale one of the first sales in the crypto art realm that got everybody to really sit up and take notice because of how much money was involved. Um, so, I mean, I was, I was actually, you know, taking a bunch of um, art, art classes and art workshops and, and, you know, chatting with um, my fellow artists right around the time when that happened. And it was the only thing anybody was talking about in any of my art circles. Um, people that had never been, you know, remotely interested in getting involved in digital art at all or in crypto or whatever, people that didn't have, you know, cryptocurrency um, suddenly were really excited about it. So it just, it seemed like that was a moment, a watershed moment. We were all like, oh, this is really exciting. Um, and that, I mean, that was one of the, you know, one of the pivotal moments um, for me. I was like, okay, well, I have a lot of digital art that I have not known what to do with. Um, and it sort of felt like, okay, this is now, uh, you know, the perfect moment to really um, give myself the time, like just take that, take that opportunity to really um, invest the time in figuring out how this all works. And it, it really is, you know, as we know from Sophia's presentation earlier, like there is a lot to learn. There's a lot of logistical, um, you know, how to's involved. I mean, for me, I had to, I had to go to Coinbase and set up my crypto wallets. I didn't really have any of that. Um, it was a lot of learning involved there. It was a lot of researching the different platforms and figuring out, um, you know, there are all these different platforms that you guys have probably heard of. There's like Nifty Gateway and Rarible and OpenSea and, um, you know, all sorts of other names that I think are really out there right now. And I, you know, I did a lot of research, um, you know, looking into different platforms and the communities of artists associated with those platforms because everyone has a different personality. They all have a different kind of vibe. Um, and I think it's really important, um, you know, to find a place where you feel like you and your art are at home and you feel 
uh, you know, welcome and inspired and that you want to be part of a community and you know, both to participate and, you know, share your art, but also to buy art and to give feedback to other artists and to be an active member of, of that community. So I spent a lot of time and it was, you know, a bit of trial and error. Um, and I started off actually um, in Rarible. I did a, a I was there for a, a hot minute and then for reasons Sophia kind of hinted at, I just, I think Ethereum for me wasn't a good fit for some reason, for various reasons. And I went uh, over to Tezos and um, found uh, a platform that I really love actually through um, seeing Sophia um, discuss it on Twitter, um, a platform called Hick at Nunk, which is again on the Tezos blockchain and um, just has a really kind of interesting sort of pioneering spirit. It's a lot of experimental work, a lot of like really um, beautiful conceptual work and really thoughtful artists and, um, you know, people that are really concerned about their environmental footprint. Um, so I kind of migrated over there and um, uh, yeah, and then I've been, I've been sort of working on that platform ever since. And it's been really, um, really lovely and inspiring and all around a very positive experience once, once those initial um, you know, once that initial learning curve was, um, they got past that point. Right. I mean, I do think that it's one of those things. I mean, this also happens even with, you know, pretty much anything like 3D scanning and 3D printing. And there's this assumption that you have this tool and that everything is like, it's ready made, that there's no experimentation, that there's no, it, I don't know, for some reason, digital tools, people think that it's, everything's just immediately a bit like it's just ready but I, I like what you're talking about having to you know spend the time getting to know these different communities and understanding like which platforms might be a better fit for you um there are some really good questions um mm -hmm. in the chat that I just want to like yeah I, I'm happy to, to touch on them if you'd like um yeah because I, I think like there's one like Joanne has you know who usually owns the platforms artists investors so uh, mm -hmm. this is funny because I actually had a conversation uh, with one of the platforms the other day uh, about this trying to do whatever. They are non-custodial. Um, what that means is they basically provide the infrastructure for artists to come in, uh, you know, upload their artwork and everyone is free to transact. They just take, you know, a, a percentage of, of the sale. So it'll probably be like a 2% uh, tax, so to speak, um, you know, on, on that sale because they facilitated it, but they don't, uh, they, I guess, own the platform. They all have kind of different uh, ethos and, and personalities. And there's, you know, the, you go to each one of them, you test them all out at this point. It's kind of like every artist uh, I've spoken to has, who has entered the uh, crypto space has really had to dip their toes in multiple marketplaces to see which one makes sense for them. Some of them bring in different collectors, different artists. I, um, you know, like Sasha had mentioned, like Hick and Nunk has been, you know, a blast. It's it's so fun to go in there. Um, it has like this endless scroll. It's not, it's a little bit of like a brutalist feel to it. Uh, you know, there are no like usernames, I think there might be now, but at the point, like at one point there were like no usernames and, you know, and that was also part, like, I thought I would hate that, but I kind of loved it because it let the art really speak for itself. And you would let the art more than the artist speak to you and be like, oh, I want that in my collection. Um, and, and that was really, really um, awesome. So hopefully that uh, answered the question on, on the platforms. Uh, but in terms of the carbon offsets, I have heard there are a lot of different initiatives happening right now. And, uh, you know, I don't think the, you know, I can come here and tell you that this is the most uh, environmental friendly thing out there but I think when you can compare it to our global fine art market as it stands uh, you know when we're traveling you know pre-pandemic traveling around the world with all of these collections hopping on a plane with from our Basel to or like to Hong Kong to Switzerland to Miami to LA and you have people moving huge amounts of work all over the place, shipping it. And then the people getting on the planes, going over there, staying in hotels, like it all adds up. And by no means is this equal that, but I think we're at a point now where we see it. We can't stop what blockchain is doing. It's here to stay. The only thing we can do is provide solutions and try to figure out how can we make this more efficient? How can we find like how, and push the developers out there to see it. How, how can we make this as, as 
eco-friendly as possible for for all of us and, and make sure that it's something that we can we can you know use with like you know pride in a sense and and um you know i it's a very important conversation to be had uh but i also think it's important not to dismiss what nfts can provide just because of where we're at right now um so yeah that's kind just of add, yeah and just to add sorry um to lauren's or just to answer lauren's question um for my pov too like that definitely was weighing really heavily on my mind at the beginning and that's a big reason why i switched over to tezos and like certainly everyone should do what they feel comfortable with and i completely agree with what sophia said i've had lots of conversation with artists where it was sort of like well you know this artist you know has like a, a thousand pound sculpture that they're shipping off you know and that that versus like me minting a tiny piece on ethereum like you know looking at how that nets out is a tricky thing to do but for me at least moving over to tezos was a game changer um both because it removed a lot of that like i think the um the environmental impact of minting on a proof of stake platform like that is really really small like i think it's i've you know i've done a lot of due diligence and i i don't profess to be a total expert on this but um in a lot of the research that i've done on this um you know experts are equating the amount of energy used to mint on Tezos to maybe send, sending off a tweet or posting something to Instagram. So it's really nominal. And there are new platforms cropping up where you can, um, you know, look if that's important to you. There's Calamint as well as Hickenook. So um, yeah, again, I think it's, it's important if that's something that's uh, top of mind for you as an artist, then that should be part of your calculations in terms of figuring out where, where to go. Definitely. Um, and, and yeah, I mean, I think it, it's a conversation all in itself and I would love to kind of get a group of, of experts in all of this, just to, you know, to, to talk about it because I think it's important and it's not something that we can, we can ignore. Um, but also I think that it might actually be adding to an important conversation. I mean, in general, I think that the environment or environmental impact is something that we need to be having conversations about in the, like in every sector. Yeah. like all the time and and maybe this is a good excuse to really talk about you know environmental impacts and what we can do there's been some really interesting reporting done on this too like if i can find it i'll put it in the chat but there was a great article in the new york times maybe a month or so ago about this um and just looking at some some crypto artists and nft artists that are really trying to push things in the right direction in this space I think um, just to, to keep going on these on these questions, because I know where we are with time, um, is there a process of getting onto the platform? Like, is it like it's curated or not? I think is the question. Um, each platform is different. I know that some there are certain platforms that you need to apply to. And, you know, it's it, it's a waiting game, waiting to see if you can get approved and, and you know, become part of that. It's usually ones that have kind of like invest that have, you know, are a lot larger and are trying to kind of like have a very specific, uh, you know, feel to it. So I like super rare is one of them where it's this whole idea of just like one of ones you need to apply, um, mm. you know, and they decide like within their own team, like who, who gets in and who doesn't. And I think it's the same with foundation. I think you can get invites. So that one's a little bit cooler where like friends of friends, I think can invite each other uh, to join. And then uh, there are some other ones where you can go ahead and just mint your work. Like you can go on OpenSea and create your own collection and, and mint your work, or you can go on, on Hick and Nunk and just, well, and we'll, we'll uh, Sasha will walk you guys through what that looks like. Uh, yeah, we're, we're gonna do that in about like, yeah, 10 minutes or so, but. Um, I think what we can do is maybe just get through maybe one more question. And then um, also I want, I just want to repeat that, like, if there are platforms that you two really love and you browse and you just like are excited about, um, put it in the chat so people can um, click on those things or just find those, you know, search for those names and find them. Um, but yeah, so we can, I think we can go, maybe uh, Sophia can answer like one or two more questions and then we can switch over. And Sasha is actually going to be live minting something for us so that we can actually see that whole process. Um, okay, so I think this is a good one here. Um, I, I can't touch upon the minting and the photography because I don't uh, do that personally. So I will touch on the second uh, question that I have here, like once you mint, uh, what are the good avenues to promote it since the marketplace is so full? Cool. So one of the big things about artwork in this like digital native space is that 
you need to now become a digital citizen and you need to really do your part on getting out there and speaking about your practice in a, the most public forums you can. So on Twitter, on Instagram, on, uh, you know, there are different chat rooms called like the, uh, these Discord servers um, and really get people to engage with people, share your work, talk about it, that is that is where we see some of like the most successful artists coming like like kind of following that that route i think you know people are really quick to dismiss people um you know and his work i'll say you know yes i don't think that the work that they chose was probably the best his aesthetic personally is not for me but you cannot deny the impact that he's had um because of the community that he's built around his work the man has made an artwork every single day like he has his own like crew of people that's like are just waiting for that artwork and he'll give talks at, at uh you know at events and at that talk he'll he'll be doing his artwork so that he can get that one artwork a day which is his whole his whole thing and so you know this is a long time running of kind of, again, being patient, building your community. And that's where we see a lot of this success coming from. And then also working with curators. So like, you know, one of the things that like I do as a curator is weed through a lot of the work that's out there and try to find cool projects and, and cool, you know, make, you know, cool exhibitions to showcase this amazing artwork, you know, and, and the collectors appreciate it. The, they, they love it. The last show I did, I sent over like a preview link to a few, a few buyers and I had to stop. I had to shut it down because I almost sold out of the show before we even got there. You know what I mean? It's it, it you have to connect with people who are in the space and are willing to, to promote it and uh, get you there. So, um, these relationships, building relationships online is everything. It's no longer going walking over to your neighborhood gallery and showing them your, your work. It's sending emails out, it's setting up calls, it's talking to someone on Twitter, talking to someone on Instagram. And for the introverts out there, honestly, like it's kind of better. Like I, I have had so many meetings sitting in my sweatpants, like like at, at my house, uh, like it's, it's amazing. So you don't have to go out of your house. You don't have to put on all this makeup and get ready and get in the car, you know, and do all these things like, you're writing emails, you can copy paste them, you can make, you know what I mean? And just start talking, just start chatting and, you know, have a, if it'll make you feel better to have a, a you know, a, 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 an alter ego, like do it. Like, you know, there's, there's nothing stopping you, but you do have to get out there and you do need to make sure that people understand your work so that they can rally behind it and have a reason to want to purchase it. Um, so yeah, that was kind of like my, than where I went with that. Um, when I love, I love this idea of digital digital citizenship. Like that, this is like it's a whole other kind of realm. In that, um, you know, much like promoting when artists are like, well, how do I get my work into a gallery? It's like going to those galleries, or yeah. it's the same. I mean, it's the same conversation, but now it's like that you have to do all that digitally, which sounds exhausting, but also exciting well, and interesting. You know, it's little by little, I think you know, for the longest time, I like even like artists, whatever it may be, there were some days where I didn't want to do. I don't want to talk to anyone. I don't want to do anything, but like just one post, just one post, you walk away. Like, you know, like post that one work of your, your, your work in progress or that one tweet. Like this year, I think is like the first time I've actually been like active on Twitter for the longest time. I was always very hush hush. I didn't really, you know, do say much on there. I was actually terrified of just like speaking on Twitter. And yeah. I think now it's just like, well, like who else am I going to talk to? Like, exactly. <laughs> Like you kind of might as well. Um, and so yeah, I think it, it, and it's and it's opened up a lot of opportunities. So I have to say. Can I just uh, also add that um, I think like at at least for me, I think you know it doesn't come naturally to me to kind of go out and promote my work. But I 100% agree it's the only way to do things when you're in this world. And I've found that not only have I overcome that discomfort, but I've actually become really excited by the conversations and the interactions that come out of doing that. I think like both in terms of getting to know the community better and letting them get to know your work better and just starting conversations online and things like that. It's been really, really productive and exciting. Um, and, you know, helps kind of inspire new ideas even. And I think it's really important also like as an artist to be able to talk about your work, you know, in this way, um, you should be able to do it like, I guess, offline too, but to be able to actually articulate what it is about your work that is important and why people should be interested in it is really essential. So I think um, it's a really good exercise to just start, you know, start doing it, get comfortable with it over time. And I, 
I, I, you know, again, I have gotten a lot more out of it than merely selling artwork. I think it's really been beneficial in so many ways. So I recommend it. Yeah. <laughs> no, it was super valuable. There's one more question in the chat that says minting costs are sometimes over $150 per piece. Can you suggest some good reliable ways to mint? Oh, uh, I mean, I wish I knew. Um, I think we're we're really waiting on on some upgrades to this, this at least specifically on on Ethereum. The minting charges for on um, Tezos are, are they're nothing. They're so like maybe just try Tezos, right? Like ten yeah. cents, twenty five yeah. cents. I mean, um, yeah, <laughs> they're they're nothing. And then the demographic of characteristics of NFT collectors. So there's a wide variety. I mean, I think um, you know we see. Uh, you know, a lot of people, a lot of people with the spending power were the people who came in early and the people who came in early tend to be more tech focused, tend to have like that, um, you know, they have somewhat of a tech background and that's why they understood it or they, for some reason they read about it and they're like, okay, yes, like I bought in at Ethereum and all these things when they were, you know, on the sense. And so now I have all this money and I can buy whatever I want. I am the whale. Um, that is another term. You should know whales. That means someone who has a lot of spending power, they can buy a lot of artwork. Uh, those are like the big collectors in the space. Um, but I think the demographics, is, it's all over. It's, it's all over. Um, I, you know, I, when you think about an art collector or an NFT collector, I don't think that I'm probably like the first person that you think of, but like there are a lot of me's and Sasha's out there that are that are doing this. There are also a lot of, you know, the archetypal like crypto bro, tech bro that you hear out there. Yes, there are a lot of them out there as well. But you know, there are people who are who are really interested in the artwork too. And, and I think it's it's um for the most part, we have the two, again, there's like different factions in all of this, but we have a group of people who really love digital art and are happy to support it. And then you do have those people who look at it as an investment and they're just trying to see how they can make a quick buck. But you see that in the tip, in the, the usual fine art world too, uh, you know, with like the artists like, you know, Alec Monopoly and things like that. They're like, oh yeah, like, you know, it's hype and it's a bunch of bros that are buying it. Um, it's true um and you know that's that's uh kind of yeah you, you can see that in, in any space but hopefully there, there, there's a lot of us out there um so yeah don't do what do what you do speak to your your body of work and the right people will find you um can one see minting like buying a nice frame and storage for the piece um storage yeah i mean like i can i can see that it's more of like your your title to it um as a oh cost wise uh, yeah and i mean i think as a as someone who collects an artwork what you're getting is this um when you get an nft you can really think about it as your title of ownership to display the piece like you would with any traditional fine artwork like if i buy your artwork i have the right to now display it um, I don't have the right to, you know, reproduce it and do all of these things, but um, part of the conservation of a digital piece mm -hmm. is also on the collector to, you know, download a copy of it, make it, keep it there. Like you have the right to display that work. And because we have this like variable media that we can kind of like share in different spaces, like I can showcase it on my computer. I can, we now have a bunch of, uh, digital screens that are popping up that you can share it on your digital screen like you have the right to display it so it's kind of on you to decide how you want to do do that um but yeah the frame it, it, it's i think it's important to to know how certain is it important yeah like you know how certain of uh, um marketplaces store the artwork um so as a collector always have a, a local file for for you just in case yeah that's yeah. i think that's a really good recommendation um okay so do sasha do we want to do you want to take it away and, <laughs> and show us how to how to actually mint one of these guys live yeah. uh tokenization let's give it a shot keeping in mind that um as we've been saying this is sort of the wild west and there are sometimes hiccups, but I'm gonna share my screen um, and show you guys my Hick at Nunk page. It's got a great name. Yeah, it's so fun. I, it took me a minute to figure out how to pronounce it. I was like, what? And 
It's yeah. funny because I was drawn to it for a lot of reasons and the name wasn't one. And then the more I thought about it, I was like, actually, so Hicketnunk is Latin. It's a Latin phrase that means here and now. Mm. And a lot of the work I do is translating ancient Latin. <laughs> so <laughs> it's, it, I was thinking about it like, oh, of course I ended up on this platform. <laughs> it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Um, so, okay, so this is this is my page on Hicketnunk. So I just, maybe I'll start by just like saying a couple of quick things. So again, like it is, a, every platform does have a very different aesthetic, a very different um, interface. And this one does tend to be like very streamlined, very straightforward. It kind of is a good place, a good way to showcase um, art because it's very, you know, it's either white or black, you can kind of choose the color, but it's, it's pretty streamlined and minimal. Um, it's also, you know, very young. Um, and uh, it also has like a very pioneering spirit in that a lot of the people, a lot of the artists that are involved in this platform are actually contributors to the development. Um, I can't claim to do that. I'm not technically proficient enough, but a lot of artists who are involved in this space will actually, they'll notice a bug and then they'll go and they'll actually fix it. There's a whole like Discord server and other channels where they've got um, communications open for reporting like little glitches or problems that come up on the site. And then the artists kind of jump in and like figure out how to fix it. So it's really collaborative. It's kind of like an art commune in that way, like or an art cooperative where everyone's really contributing something. You're either contributing your talents as a developer, you're contributing you know, your art and your ideas. You're talking about the platform in other social platforms to spread word and, uh, you know, a word of mouth and spread awareness about the art and the artist. So everyone's really doing something. There aren't really, I don't know of that many artists who are on here who are kind of like just in it to come here and, you know, get credit for your art. Everyone's involved in some way. So that's my plug for this platform. But um, just to kind of give you visuals of a few things that um, Sophia was talking about. So this is my, um, my wallet um, browser extension. So um, this little guy basically like has all the information um, associated with my account here. Like all this stuff is pretty much public. Um, you can, um, you know, click into here and you can kind of look at all the things that are in your wallet. You can kind of see when you glance down through here, you have all your assets, both your minted artworks and also things that you've um, purchased or collected from other artists. So it's all here for you to kind of dive into and then you know your um, whatever funds you have like associated with this account just kind of sit here. Um, so that's that browser extension. And then um, yeah, so I'll just giving you a quick tour actually let me just show you the the front of this um platform yeah like a quick scroll through so we can see what it looks like to collect on hick and dunk so yeah cool. and i would also i should say it does take a long time to load these days which is something that i think everyone's working on but there's so much in it that it is a little sluggish at the moment but so this is just a kind of a continuous continuously updated stream of new things that are being minted in real time by artists and you, you just kind of can sit here and look at what's coming through, um, you know, or you can um, you can do a little bit of searching by artists that you really like. But one of the, I guess, one of the potential cons of the site, or maybe it's maybe it's a good thing, depending on how you look at it, is it's a bit hard to find um, artist pages. Um, there are some uh, contributors to the site who are actually creating um, little tools to um, to create links but otherwise the only way to kind of navigate to a page is to kind of put in your account handle which is this long string of numbers it's your wallet um your wallet handle so uh anyway this is my collection so you basically have all the artwork that you've minted on one page and then you have a collection of all the artwork that you've purchased from other artists um, or that you've you know collected in some way. We, there's a lot of sharing that goes on, at least in this community. I don't know if that's true across platforms, but um, we have a lot of artists who like to trade or we like to kind of share things that we think another artist would like. So there's a lot of collecting that way. But I have a big collection here. And um, a shout out Helena Sadin's piece there. I love it. I have it too. This one? Yeah. Yes, yes, <laughs> her, so work is, her work is fantastic. I I'm really, really love it. Helena's. I think she's, I, I think at least as of yesterday, the day before, she was maybe the only female artist in the top 10 on Hey Get no, and the rest are Really? Oh my God, so, I'm so proud of her. Yeah, she's incredible. Um, I guess um, shameless plug, I'm working on a book with her. Um, so keep a lookout for that. That's amazing. Well, so just to give you guys a little glimpse here. So if you want to go and look at more of her work, you click on 
this, you can see this particular artwork, you have all the information about it. So title of the artwork, the description, it's tagged. Um, you can see how many editions were made, how many are still available and for how much. Um, and then the issuer is, you know, she's, it's the artist. So you can go and look at more of what she's creating. Um, again, takes a little time to load these days, but um, yeah, but it's pretty easy to jump around from, um, from collection to collection, from artist to artist. But I think I'm going to quickly just walk you through what it's like to mint something. And I'm going to mint um, the code poem that we used um, on the flyer for this event, uh, is there poetry on Mars? So, um, so here's a little, oops, I don't want to do that. So there's a drop down here and you can see there's different um, options. Manage assets takes you back to that page where you have your collection and your, the collection of artists um, who you've bought. Um, Object mint is what you want to hit on when you are ready to mint your artwork. So it takes you to this page where it's pretty straightforward. Again, it's kind of like, you know, preparing a blog post or something like that. It's not terribly difficult at all. Um, but, you know, before you're able to do this, you have to do all the things that Sophia walked us through in the beginning, which is set up your crypto wallet and, you know, get set up on the account and all that. So that's kind of the heavy lifting. And then, you know, obviously you have to prepare your work off site. So whatever format it's in, you can kind of look through whatever platform you're on, they have, um, you know, certain formats that are accepted. So you kind of need to check that before you're um, ready to upload and make sure that your file will work. Um, and then just come in here and fill it all in. So um, bear with me one moment, I fill this in. Um, I'm going to call this a speculative poem. And then I think best practices on this site are to include your handle or to include your name somewhere here. So when it mints, um, your name is somewhere on the description. And then any other information you want to include. So I'm going to say this piece was actually originally created in 2020, but it was minted 2021 in an edition of 10. Um, again, you can put whatever you want here, but a lot of artists like to put what the edition number, you know, how many um, you're minting here, just so it's easily accessible. Um, and then tags. Um, Again, you can put your name, um, poetry, code poems, Mars, whatever else you wanna put that you think is relevant. Um, and then I think I'm gonna mint 10 of these. And then, so royalties, Sophia touched on this earlier, but one of the, you know, one of the amazing things about NFTs is that um, you're able to specify a percentage of royalties that you'd like to receive every time someone, you know, anytime a piece of uh, a token changes hands. I think again, um, right now, I'm just gonna leave it at 10, which is sort of, you know, typical, I think for a lot of artists, I think more than that, um, you know, is, I think it depends on uh, your audience and, um, you know, your track record and all that. But I think 10 is a pretty good number for a lot of um, more emerging artists and starting artists. So I'll leave it like that for now. And then upload object. Um, again, this is just like attaching a file. It's pretty straightforward. Um, I'm gonna pull that in. Can you guys still see my screen? Cause it's doing some weird stuff here. Okay, so hopefully this will work. So the next step is to just preview it and you wanna make sure in the preview um, that everything is correct because um, as we were saying before, once you mint a piece, there's no going back. There's no you know editing. Um, it's on the blockchain. Uh, the only thing you can do if you've made a mistake or you wanna get rid of a piece of art after the fact is to burn it, which is um, sort of a costly mistake, especially if you're minting on the Ethereum blockchain. Um, so you wanna just double check and make sure that everything you need is in there. And then once you're good to go, I think that looks good. I'm gonna press mint. And then it usually, takes a little while. Again, it depends on how busy things are. It depends on the platform. Um, for this particular platform, it can usually take, I don't know, like a minute or two um, to process. Um, so we can see how it goes. But while we're waiting, I don't know if you guys have, if anyone has questions. I, I actually had a comment that uh, while you were going through the royalties, I just wanted to point out um, and why it's important for artists to be very vocal in the space. So when when 
these started to come when when nft started coming out and these marketplaces were propping up royalties were not built into to to the structure of it mm -hmm. it wasn't until a, a group of artists got together and basically wrote um you know i don't know if manifesto is the right word but it's basically like this like whole idea like this is what we believe artists deserve royalties and they really pushed all of the marketplaces to do this and now it's the norm now every single now it is expected for each of these artists on any of these platforms to include royalties for the artists because that is you know it's what artists wanted so um, i think it's just important it, to to note that that's kind of how it came to be. It wasn't uh, this inherent thing that, that existed. Uh, artists really had to go up to bat for themselves and say, include this. Like, if we can do it, we need to be doing it. Um, and, and thank God that they did. It's a great point. Yeah. Um, okay, so looks like we're in business. Let's see. So that's minting. But the next step is then um, actually swapping it. Sophia, mm -hmm. did you mention swapping earlier, or do I you want? I did not to mention swapping. I feel like swapping is a very uh, hick and nunk uh, uh, thing, which is really it's it's so fun. It's so fun. Um, is oh, these are really good questions. We can talk about them one more, one more time. Yeah, I was gonna say there's some copyright questions and Instagram. Yeah, I have I have a, a nice response to it. Maybe go for it and answer them now if you feel like it, because I think taking a hot minute to um uh yeah so there's there's a few things so evan's question uh how do you feel a platform like instagram will respond with instagram need to re-incentivize folks to post their work that leads to a very very interesting concept of this idea of kind of like token economics um which is an entirely different conversation for another day but we're seeing really really cool things of how people are being incentivized to to um you know create memes so you can actually there's actually one that came out as a joke it's called meme protocol and i recommend you take a look you know look put meme protocol into uh into youtube and watch that later where it kind of touches on it um and there's also this idea of artists creating tokens uh based off their artwork so there was a an artist that created artwork collectors bought you know all 20 of his pieces and then all 20 of those pieces, uh, all 20 of those collectors got uh, what's also referred to as an airdrop, which they received tokens from, from the artist. And now for the next artwork that he, the next product that he posted, you could only purchase it if you had his tokens and you only got those tokens if you bought his previous pieces. Um, I learned that the hard way because I wanted one of those works, but I hadn't I hadn't purchased uh, one of his pieces before, so I couldn't participate. And it was just so, so cool. Um, so we're starting to see things like that happening. Uh, and I think we're, there, there, there are new social media um, uh, platforms that are coming out, uh, one called Nifties that I know it is kind of trying to address the situation here. And then is this like selling a copyright? Um, I guess I, we're still trying to uh, prep the object. So, um, which I can also, maybe we can speak yeah, about. Yeah, 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 yeah. I would love to hear you as an artist. I was yeah. just gonna say super fast before you jump in there. It's just that this does, it, it happens quite a lot. Actually, there is, uh, you know, there are like kinks in the system. Things are a little bit rusty or things get really busy. So um, it's not, you know, uncommon for, um, you know, for the mint to sort of not work the first time. And it actually, if you go into your wallet, you'll see that it says backtrack or there's an error that comes up. So just to note, like if there is uh, any sort of a problem like that, when, you, when you're um, trying to mint an object, it's usually just a matter of going back and trying again. Yeah. Not uncommon at all. Yeah. Anyway. Um, I think that's good to point out, though, because again, I think there is an assumption that these things are just like ready to go and there's like no errors, there's no issues, but like a lot of new technology, it's just as like experimental as, you know, a sculpture material or something where you're you know, applying it and it's like acting a little strange and there's too much moisture in the air, <laughs> like all of a sudden it doesn't work. Um, Oh, Cheryl has a question too. Uh, there's a, so we can touch on the. I wanted to 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 uh, address the copyright question. So, um, 
again, this is the title to the work. That's how you can think about what an NFT is. There are artists that are being very smart about uh, what they include when they tokenize an artwork. So making use of the creative commons and being like, okay, you have the right to showcase this work. You have the right to do this. Or there are some artists that are like, yeah, you can, if you want to buy this work and yeah, feel free to commercialize it for up to a hundred thousand dollars. That's fine with me. Um, so it's going to be really, it's going to be on the artist to be very, very clear about what you can and cannot do with your work. And I, and I hope to see kind of like at one point where you can make your work and you can decide what kind of rights you want associated with it, but you can really think about it. Um, as a traditional artwork where if I buy your piece from you, you as the artist own the, you own the intellectual property rights of, of the work that is your creative, um, you know, it's your intellectual property, like you created it. If I wanted to go and reproduce it and, and make money off of that, I you know, I, I, I could, you could, you could, um, you know, take me to court and I'm pretty, you know, you would, you would most likely win that case uh, if, you know, if, if it was, is very clear. So um, it is, it is selling the title to the work. It's a, you know, this idea like you, you own, own the work, you can display it, you can do all these things, but it is not your intellectual property. Um, and so I think that's the, the, the important part. And I think um, as we're seeing a lot of people enter this space and think about, you know, there's the way that the, the internet works anyway, we see a lot of artists getting their artwork stolen and being put on, on uh, you know, t-shirts and things like this. And so um, if you show that this artwork that you, this, this, this asset, so to speak, because it could be a, a graphic design something you, I think there'll be a point where there are marketplaces for all types of stuff like that. But, um, you know, you would be able to say, I minted this piece, this is my piece, this is the day that I created it, this, this, um, uh, you know, that I'm the owner of it. And this company here made this release this, uh, this t shirt two months later, like, they can't do that. This is my work, uh, kind of thing. So, uh, yeah, and then, uh, does it have to be? So when you're working with Hick and Nunk, yes, it is uh, in Tezos. Um, if you are someone who wants to experiment with Tezos, but would like to have Ethereum, you can also swap your coins. So like, I can put all my stuff, my Tezos here in this wallet. I can transfer it over to, uh, you know, a Coinbase or a Uniswap. Uniswap is like a, you know, it, it's, its own whole other vocabulary or a decentralized autonomous organization um, that runs on its own uh, DAOs. You guys will be hearing about those a lot. Uh, I, can, I promise you. Uh, but again, conversation for another day. Um, you can always switch your, your Tezos over to Ethereum if you want to invest in Ethereum or if you want to invest in, in uh, uh, Bitcoin, if you want to have those tokens. Um, you know, that's so, sorry. I'm realizing, uh, Sasha, that you're, you're done here and I'm still talking about. No, that's OK. Go for it. Yeah. It finally uh, worked, but okay, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> okay, cool. I'm gonna after this talk, I'm gonna go over there and and, and scoop one up. Um, <laughs> we have to. We'll uh, see. Yeah, we'll see if we can actually swap it though. Okay, so yeah. that was that's the next phase, right? So um, as you can see, it's minted, it's now at the top of the collection. So it went through, yay. Um, but then the next step, this is not yet for sale, so it's just in your collection, but um, I still own all these editions right now. So um, the next thing you have to do is go through and actually swap the piece. And again, like I realize that vernacular is particular here, but um, basically it's just putting up the artwork for sale. So on this platform, you do that by going to swap. Uh, and then it allows you to enter the number of objects that you wanna make available for sale. And then it also asks you to, to set your price. So um, you can put um, you know, all of them for sale. You can put none of them for sale and just keep them all for yourself and just kind of give them out as gifts or something. You can save them for later, or you can set you know, any number between uh, zero and the total that you've made. So I'm gonna put all of them um, for sale and um, I'll just like set it. Did we say I'll set it at five Tez or something for now? Tezos are like six dollars to a Tezos, so this is like thirty bucks. Um, so let's. Oh, and I would also just add. Um, again, I think this varies from platform to platform, but there are a lot of artists, especially when they're starting out, who like to mint artwork and then set it, uh, basically set it at zero um, as a sale price, just to kind of give it as a gift to the community or something like that. And um, just like a word of 
a caution about that. Um, there are now like a lot of bots who are scooping up free artwork. Um, so I think that's become a really big problem in certain platforms lately. So I would not recommend that if it's something that anyone here is considering, just you can set it at like almost zero. Um, okay, and then um, just press swap and it's the same, sort of the same thing as last time. Hopefully it goes through. Sometimes this stage gets uh, backtracked as well. So we'll kind of have to see if it, um, if it goes through on the first try, but hopefully that should be it. And then, um, yeah, once that step is complete, then um, it's available for sale. And then the final step is to sort of take, um, take the artwork uh, out into the world, out into social media and publicize it in some way. So you can um, you know, announce on Twitter that you've just minted a new piece or you can, you know, if you're part of an exhibition or something like that, then that would sort of be the next step is to take it, take it out into the world. That's amazing. Like this is such a, it's so awesome to see this actually happening. I mean, it's, I think it, it's also very different from platform to platform. So just be aware of that. Um, but like, it's, you guys you can all see it's not hard. It's just a matter of getting used to the interface and make sure that you have all these pieces set up. It is pending. Um, yeah, I mean, it takes, it takes a, a minute for, for these transactions to process just because of, you know, the, the nature of a decentralized organization, you know what I mean? Uh, or just like a decentralized infrastructure. So um, yeah, th that's another thing with, with working in this space. We're used to things happening very quickly. Um, you're kind of forced to slow down a little bit when it comes to working with, uh, with this type of you know, ecosystem just because of the sheer volume of it um, and how many transactions are happening. And I know that they're working on trying to make these things more efficient. Uh, but, you know, for the moment, it, it typically takes a few minutes for, for things to, to go through. Sometimes sometimes it can be as quick as, a, as 30 seconds, like yeah. you know, a few seconds. Uh, some days you're really lucky, but I'm sure there are plenty of people yeah. on the list right now uh, shopping. Good, like, that's an example of, again, like you'll get that sort of error message. So we'll try again, but um, yeah, I mean, I guess the other thing to be aware of is just on this platform, because the, the costs involved are so minimal, like you can see when it comes up here, it'll show you how much this actually costs. So gas fee, six cents, the storage fee max, 10 cents. Like this is, if it doesn't go through, it's not a big deal. When I was in the very beginning, when I was trying to mint things on Rarible, for example, um, it's a different story. Um, so I think that's something to keep in mind as well, and just in terms of remembering what your budget for these things is. Derek has a question, which is um, curious how often your pieces have resold. Um, that's a great question. I mean, some things have definitely resold, but there's no sort of automated way on this platform, at least, of knowing. I kind of have to either um, manually search for it, or I believe there's... I, I believe there's an artist who actually recently built a tool for this platform where you type in, or you, you know, you, you navigate to a particular URL, um, include your handle at the end, and it will sort of bring up your history. Um, so you can go in and look at it that way. I haven't done that in a few days, but um, no, there are, I mean, there's a fair, a fair amount of things that have resold. Um, there are a lot of things that are also on the secondary market that haven't sold yet, but that are there and they're relisted. Um, you know, some people collect things because they want to keep it and some people collect things because they want to turn it around right away. And it's sort of a mix of a mix of the two. Let's see, did it go through? <laughs> I don't know. Oh gosh. That's so funny because I've, I've never experienced that backtrack, I guess, like as more of a collector than a, and I, and I, uh, you know, played around with, with minting like an old piece of mine. I actually got super nervous and then I burned it, but, um, <laughs> So it's more fun for me to curate things and show my show my own work. Um, but, we also, I mean, yeah. we can always move on to other more exciting things. I think everyone sort of gets the idea, and I'm happy to answer any specific questions about the process. That um, yeah, well, maybe we can maybe we can stop sharing your screen and we can actually just have a conversation um, because there are still I think maybe there are a few more questions um, in the chat, but really at this point, um, you know, feel free also if you do want to uh, turn on your screen and just ask a question, you are more than welcome to. Um, you can just have the gallery view and so you can see all of us together. 
um, feel free to just say hey and ask a question. Um, especially if there's something we, you know, that hasn't been addressed. And if not, I'm going to leave it to um, Sophia and Sasha to just dive into anything that you all want to talk about. Um, well, I mean, I did have one more question, which is like, what are you most excited about? But clearly everything's been so exciting. <laughs> oh, yeah. Um, yeah, if anybody has a question, again, feel free to raise your hand or just say, hey, or put it in the chat. And if not, these two are just going to talk about how excited they are. <laughs> been asking so many questions, but I, I, um, I guess the question is, could you, like you were saying, people could buy the art and then put it on t-shirts and things like that. Is yeah. that how people use them? So after a collector buys this art, you know, buys your artwork, what are they doing with it? Are, are, are they putting it on t-shirts or are uh, they- so I, probably, I probably confuse you by like going, just like getting, you know, talking about so many things at once, but um, <laughs> there are, there was an artist uh, that um, did give permission to commercialize uh, her work. I forgot the, the name of the common that she used, but is this idea that you feel free to put it on whatever you want. So a ton of the collectors, um, you know, she, she had made a bunch of these like characters uh, that were really, really cute. And so people were making socks out of them. They were making pillows. They were making, uh, you know. I see you, Saki. I was also. Uh, a few a few different things. Uh, so she, she gave permission, so that was okay. Um, but I think now if you if you have a digital record of an artwork and let's say someone did that illegally, you could at least have that and say, this was the original creation of the artwork. Do not do that. You cannot do that. You do not have the right to right. do that, not the owner. Great. Um, there's another question. Saki has a... Sorry, it went through finally. Okay. <laughs> oh, great. Hey, thank you. This is super interesting. Can you hear me? Yeah. Um, I'm just curious. Uh, are there any possibilities for sound or like yeah. um, to be integrated because I'm a video artist or just even so how did would that just be the same thing you could upload like a movie file even or Sasha I don't know if you have yeah a... no definitely I mean you can put up a movie file you can put up any sort of um yeah I, I think that's totally possible I'm actually trying to see if I can find I have a piece in my collection by someone who's doing a lot of experimental music related nfts um who's actually like creating kind of uh, interesting interactive musical objects um but I I mean I sort of feel like the sky's the limit I mean there are specific formats for each platform but a lot of um people in the space are sort of creating their own you know kinds of approaches um and creating different kinds of interactive um works that incorporate different elements and you know, whatever you can sort of dream up or create or code, um, you know, you can probably find, find a way to share it um, through, you know, through, through NFTs. Um, but definitely, I mean, it's, uh, there's all sorts of, um, there's all sorts of ways to, to do things that are not just visual and like not just static images, not just, you know, um, like what I showed is just a little 10 second video clip. Um, but, you know, you can, you can certainly mint things that are longer. You can break things up into chunks and kind of release them over time. It's like a serialized piece. You can, you mm -hmm. can make a whole album of music. Um, yeah, if I can find this piece, I'll just throw it up on screen really quickly because it's really uh, one of the more interesting things I've seen. I was talking to like a 3D artist who works, you know, a lot with like, you know, 3D scanned objects or 3D objects and was saying that there are certain files that file types that aren't really supported right now, but there's lots of different ways like, yeah, a movie file or there are other file types that you can sort of translate it into and then post or and then mint. Awesome. That's so cool. Thank you. So here's an example of you, if you can see this. Um, cool. I'm in record. So you can Friday the 13th. Ooh. So each one has like a different um, bit of music or a bit of audio associated with it. So this is something that the, I think it was an artist, a group of artists actually, but they, you know, created this together and very kind of novel interface, interactive interface. So a, a very different approach than your typical one, but just to kind of show that there's all different ways of, um, Okay, you know, approaching how you format Friday, and create your November, artwork. And this is this would be one artwork, or is this is multiple artworks? This is one piece. Just one piece. Wow. Yeah. yeah, and also I think this is one piece that I collected for maybe 
10 TES or something. You can see now at the bottom it says collect for 84. So it's obviously been snapped up and now people are reselling theirs for more. So it's a good example of that. Could you put a link to this in the chat too? Because it's just so. so yeah, and I'm sorry, I'll stop sharing. <laughs> Okay, cool. So I, this question here, uh, collectibles versus artwork. So there are people who want to make collectibles. They want to have at least like a thousand, 10,000 pieces. They all have their different, um, you know, their, their, their rarities, the different, uh, you know, what they're, I guess I'm, not, I'm like forgetting the words, but you know, like they are different traits and, and you know, people, people love that and they have fun with it. And that is truly what that's, that's what they're there to be, to, to, to trade and to have fun with them. And you know, that that's the whole idea. Um, you can argue that CryptoPunks was one of those that it's like, it, it was a collectible. It's supposed to have fun. It's now found its way into the fine art space, but that's because context is key for absolutely every single art piece um, out there. So you can look at what they've done and, and the strides that they've made into the space and, and why it's so respected by people um, that, that are really into crypto um, as a form of backing your artwork. Uh, and so now, you know, you're seeing it at Christie's, you're seeing all of these, these art shows and people willing to pay big bucks for it uh, because of their historical context. Um, but, you know, I think for the most part, collectibles are supposed to be like a really fun time. There's, um, there's this one project, I, it's called Pixel Dicks, and I think it's the funniest thing <laughs> in the world. And they are, and they are what they sound like. They are dicks made of pixels, and you know they all have different traits. And you know it's the, it's the funniest to me. It's just like the funniest thing ever. Um, and I found them on Instagram, and I'm still too. I'm actually very nerve. Like I'm too shy to buy one, but I love it. I think it's like the, it's like super bad for uh, for NFTs. Is how I feel about it. But like that's an example of like a collectibles project that's like really fun. Funny, um, and fun and people would just kind of want to like you know jump in and buy the different ones and there's rare ones and you know it, it's silly uh, but you know what we're doing here and like you know working with fine artists and, and working with people who truly care about their crafts and are trying to create beautiful compositions and make people think um, you know that's when I would say that's that's the difference between a collectible and, and an artwork. I also think that there's a, I mean the line between the two is like very blurry and I sometimes think that we tend to you know we look at certain NFTs and we kind of call them collectibles because they're NFTs. Um, and I don't know, you think about someone like Own Kawara or, you know, artists who've done similar things where they were painting, you know, a painting a day or something, which is not so dissimilar to what Beeple's doing. And like, is that a collectible? Is that, you know, a piece of fine art? Like, I, I think, I don't know, because this is so new, there's a, the novelty factor of NFTs kind of puts it in a slightly different category. But if we step back or, you know, we zoom forward into the future and kind of look back, I feel like that we'll definitely see that there are a lot of similarities between a lot of fine art projects and conceptual art projects that we really revere as iconic and what a lot of these new NFT artists are experimenting with. I have a question. Um, yeah, I think I'm wondering. I'm wondering um, how how does minting an NFT or and how that value translates, and um, I guess what I'm trying to say is like does like say I make an, an actual painting and I would like to mint an image of that on the platform. Does minting that change the value of the actual tangible work? I don't know if that makes any sense. Yeah, I mean, Sasha, I don't know if you want to touch on that because I feel like you've done something uh, similar, but I have my own thoughts I can talk about after. Yeah, I mean, I guess really quickly, I would just say, I think, yeah, for me, I still, I feel like they're they're different but related. Like they're all part of a little ecosystem for that artwork or for that project and that they all kind of speak to each other and they do different things. So um, I actually feel like in that case, maybe minting certain things kind of increases the value of the whole little ecosystem because it adds elements and kind of enables you to build it out and add layers and maybe reach different audiences and be able to say different things about it in different places. Um, so rather than just one, you know, physical canvas, like that example I showed earlier, that on its own, you know, it, you know, it, it kind of does what it does. But now that it's in conversation with these other pieces and, um, you know, potentially like is having a dialogue with different digital elements and animated elements and um, is living, you know, it's, it's 
other lives in an NFT world, I think it actually kind of adds value to the entire enterprise. So um, that's not really, I guess that's not really answering it from a financial or monetary perspective, but I think the value like for me overall increases and I'd love to hear what Sophia has to, has to say from a, from a curator's perspective. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, it really does like depend on you as an artist, how you want to, to utilize NFTs. I think um, in terms of value, there are collectors out there that, that see the value in NFTs and they want to own um, you know, a, a digital native work. I think if you want to kind of play around with this idea of you know, that is the artwork in itself. You're taking pictures, you're creating this like physical, this digital entity of a physical work. And that now becomes its own dialogue. It's like, what is digital art? And, you know, if that one, if that is how you want to do your practice, you have every right to do that. And, you know, then maybe that artist who, the, the collector who collected that, that digital representation of it wants the actual physical piece. And you can, you know, come up with something there too. You know, the, it, it's, it's ours for the taking and for the defining, so to speak, uh, when it comes to blending the, the digital and the physical. Um, I think, you know, there will come a point where, you know, we have, uh, you know, I know I played around with this idea of, of making prints of digital native artwork and having the transaction hash printed on the bottom of it. So let's say it did ch change hands. Someone who sees that piece that's signed by the artist with the transaction hash could technically go in, like type it in and, and be able to track, like the see the origin of the piece and be able to see where, where it is now uh, or like who technically owns the NFT to that one piece should they be separated. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a bunch of different things that you can kind of like play around with it. But I think the value is what you decide to 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 do with it if that if that makes sense like um it, i know that it's it's such a uh paradigm shift in how you think about uh your your work and in, in this like digital space but uh you know there there are people who who get it and are and are excited to see uh what product how people can kind of like push it a little bit further and how they can support that mm -hmm. thank you mm -hmm. yeah that's a quick question um this is like probably coming more from a place of just, you know, being naive about all of this and also probably a place of um, maybe a place of anxiety in terms of crypto, cryptocurrency, um, that world, just not knowing much about it, but also like feeling that there's some, you know, there's a, there's an energy about it. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, I, I can think of like a specific example of um, my cousin who, you know, is, younger and like leaning into this like libertarian kind of idea and and thinking about um and this is like a, a big anecdote but mm -hmm. thinking about you know politically um this like this like focus on the individual mm -hmm. and how that kind of then responds to you know mo motivating him to, mo to vote for trump and that kind of mm -hmm. um you know trying to okay that's a whole nother conversation about you know, I don't want to necessarily make like, oh, he's interested in crypto. If so mm -hmm. facto, he's voting for Trump. I don't want to make that analogy. But at the same time, it's like, you know, I've heard and read about crypto being a cent, you know, could be um a hypothesis that is a pyramid scheme. So by motivating, you know, someone to build this ecosystem, like, okay, I I'm only I'm only able to generate value for myself, quote unquote, by motivating my friends and family to do it as well and how that kind of trickles out that's an area where um you know i i have no idea i, I so, don't know much about it it's just yeah i i i think it, it's it's something that you can like make that observation but tying it into to that narrative doesn't it, it's missing again like a larger picture i have purchased artwork from artists i have no idea what their names are do you know what mm. i mean like as as a collector i go in i take a look at the work i'm like that's stunning like mm. hell yeah like count me in uh, let, let me give you my money it's like mm. you know it, it's one of those things that um you know i think if if i go and i tell someone how excited i am about um ethereum or tezos because it's benefited me that doesn't make it into a, a pyramid scheme that just i'm excited to share with you something that's changed 
my life in a way. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. And, yeah. Yeah. So I, I think that there are a lot of observations being made, but they're being tied to a very um, harmful narrative to, to get people away from something that very well could benefit you. And, and I'm not saying that crypto is perfect. And I don't think that, um, you know, it, it, it's, it's not fair to give it this like full sweep generalization of it is bad because there are people with these certain, you know, there are bad actors everywhere, but there's, you cannot deny once you step into the space, how many incredible people are mm. actively working every day together um, to build something amazing for, for everyone. Um, yeah, I just, I just want to interject and just say that also you, we brought up this concept of the di digital citizen. Mm. And I really like that idea because it's like you walk into another world, you are like, you're, you're basically, you're trying to be a, a citizen of that place. So, you, you know, if you're in a particular platform and things are breaking and you do have coding experience, it's like, maybe you help fix the code. Yeah. Maybe you make a couple of friends, maybe a couple of friends are like, Hey, can we work together and put out a digital piece together? So I think the idea that it's all one for, I think that that's probably not true, um, in these decentralized environments where there isn't just one person, it isn't a corporation, like one person's making the decisions. It's not. Yeah, it's, it's, it's the consensus, which it's is like a decentralized approach. So like people of, you know, many different people are putting their hands on it. And maybe it, that's why it has that sort of, I guess, pioneering thing, because it's like you have to take initiative. If yeah. you're not taking initiative, you can't get anything out of it. Yeah, and and I've seen and I've seen a lot of the critiques that are out there, um, and I just feel like they fundamentally miss the point. Like there's one critique out there that was saying, you know, only some people are getting rich. Like this is essentially bullshit. Like how you're gonna put all this work out there, and you know, I'm not gonna make any money off of it. Like you know, there's so many artists that are not making money off of it. Look, like the at the end of the day, you can look at the traditional art market and say the exact same thing. It really is who you are as an artist, but also like on the business side, like you have to have that, that side of you that sells. And if you can't sell, you need to find someone who will represent you that can sell your work and help you. Um, that is really like what, what it comes down to. So when it comes to the crypto space, the world and the digital world, are like it's all yours, but you know, it has to be you for, the, for you have to go out and, and grab it. And that's really the only way, but it puts a lot of, um, it puts a lot of strength into the artist too, where you don't need to depend on a gallery anymore. You could go on a super rare, you could, you can, you know, do, you can go out there, create your own following and, and sell your own artwork with no representation whatsoever. Um, you know, and like as, as a curator, more than a gallerist, like it, it's, I don't represent any artists. I, I collaborate with them. You know what I mean? It's like, oh, I want to do this show. Like you're the right artist for that. You're the right artist for that. You're the right artist for this show that I'm envisioning. Cool. Let's do it together. Great. Like, awesome. After that, I, I'm happy to help you out with whatever you need, but like th that product's done. I, you know, that's it. Um, so I think we're, we're starting to see a kind of a shift in how, uh, you know, the traditional art world is starting to, to, to transform into this new uh, digital native uh, environment. I would also say that there are some, I mean, of course, I've heard all these criticisms as well. And I think like there is a lot of art out there that I think raises a lot of eyebrows. But having been in the world for a little while now, there is some genuinely brilliant work being done that could not happen without NFTs, mm -hmm. uh, or that couldn't really be shared um, in the way that they are. And these are things that are as you know as thought provoking as anything I've ever encountered, and um, I'm you know I'm thrilled and exhilarated by moments like that, and I wouldn't you know have found them anywhere else. So like that alone is worth the price of entry to me. And also for whatever it's worth, none of my friends or family are on the blockchain. I feel, I feel like I've made this whole new community of people that are you know sort of already in the zone, and I mm. haven't haven't needed to like bring bring people in kicking and screaming or anything <laughs> like that, but it definitely um, is something that a lot of people are asking about now. So it, yeah, it'll be really interesting to see um, who who kind of comes on board this year, next mm. year, near future. Yeah, I appreciate all these responses. I, I feel better. <laughs> I feel better. <laughs> and, and also, you know, like it, when, again, like if you think about having, if you could like take away everything you knew about this conversation, you're like, oh, we're gonna have two, people show up and talk to you about nfts and crypto like 
Sasha and I probably aren't the first things that that pop <laughs> into your mind, but like there are so many of us out there that are just like so excited and, and uh, you know, are having a good time and, mm -hmm. and believe in it and think that it's something great. And we have no, there's zero malicious intent and like how we think about like the money it's, it's, we're here for the love of the art and what it can do for uh, mm -hmm. artists truly. That's awesome. Yeah, I, th I think that that's, that's really true. And I think intention, it really does, it's, it's everything. It's like, you, if you're on there with your intentions to collaborate and your intention is to explore and like, you know, see what is possible with a new medium, uh, that's one thing if you're there to, I'm, you know, again, it's because it's an open system, it's kind of like people's intentions do matter. So it's important to find uh, like-minded people and it's it's cool to see that some of these um you know different platforms have different personalities and mm -hmm. different kinds of like people are attracted and so it really is like this it is an ecosystem there's like highlands and there's plains and there's mountains and you got to go figure out like what temperature works for you um because i i think also when i was first thinking about nfts i just was thinking about that hot you know super kind of sexy, you know, flashy artwork that that to me is not my thing at all. And and it's just, sometimes it's very like sexist and body and I don't know, I just find it very oh, yeah. like, impulsive. Yeah. And so like, I think that the fact that that maybe is like the first thing that's, it's kind of like, because it's so loud. <laughs> I think, I mean, I think it, 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 seeing, seeing the work that uh, has come, it's true. There are a lot of, there, there's a lot of artwork out there like that. And there are a lot of collectors who are into that. They have every right to be, but again, I think it, it, it brings the importance of why we need more, more faces, more space, more, just like more ideas to come and flourish. Because I think that, you know, sure, they're, they're one of the first kind of, things that we see going on there, but there's so much more, but we can't see it if artists aren't coming and showing it to us. Uh, so that's, I think that's why it's like, come, like, don't, like, <laughs> we, can't, we can't like look at it and think about all the bad things that are happening. We have to come in and make it, make it as, as good as we can. That's, that's, <laughs> our, that's our duty uh, to, to, to make sure it becomes an ecosystem that we're all proud of. No, that's a really, really good point. And I think like for me, that was the draw in the beginning. Like it wasn't all the hype of like, oh my God, everyone's getting rich in NFT world and yeah. blah, blah, blah. Like for me, I thought a lot about, you know, and I've been thinking about these things for a long time, but you know, like, can I, as a writer, as a poet, as a text-based artist, can I still, can I do everything that I want to do in a, in the traditional printed venue? Like if I write a poem and then I right. have to wait like a year and a half for it to come out in a magazine, is that relevant? Is that like, does that reflect my experience as a creative person right now? And it doesn't. And like for me, what's so exciting about NFTs for all sorts of art and all sorts of creativity is that they actually are, they're not just logistical platforms. They're actually enabling new modes of creativity. They're like unlocking new realms of imagination and letting us do things we never thought could be possible. So, and to Sophia's point, like that is what has me so excited. And that's why I, you know, I'm, you know, out there doing events like this and talking to my artist friends about this and why I really, you know, I try, like if I have, if I have friends in the art world or the poetry world that have no idea how to get involved, I will happily onboard them and, you know, offer extends to any of you as well. Please like contact me or, you know, whatever I can do to help because I think it's just so exciting as a tool um, and has just generated so much inspiration and so many new ideas for me. And I want to share that with all the creative people that I know, so. Yeah, it's really exciting. I think that's that's so that's such a beautiful sentiment, and I think that that is what's necessary in any community, any artist community, um, and any like one that has a conscience to it. So, <laughs> thanks, thanks for for that, Sasha. And on that note, um, we are at eight thirty six, so I I don't want to keep people too long. Um, but this was just incredibly informative and I am so thankful to both of our panelists so thank you both so much and thank you all mm -hmm. for attending